Good morning from Germany and hello South Korea. My name is Carsten Stöcker and today I'm in Benny Young's show about decentralized identity, also known as self-sovereign identity. Hey Benny, thanks for having me. So I'm a physicist from Germany and as a physicist, I'm personally very concerned about human health and the biodiversity collapse and climate change. I'm founder of Sverity GmbH and at Sverity GmbH, so we are using decentralized identity and electronic signature technology to establish compliance solutions, compliance solutions for all kinds of policies around human health, pharmaceutical supply chain security, a digital product passport, environmental compliance requirements, and there are a lot of so-called non-functional requirements. And we believe that we need digital signatures, decentralized identity, verifiable credentials to establish a uh, yeah, scalable compliance solution to make sure we can not only establish policies uh, and manage policies, but also enforce policies at scale to avoid any kind of greenwashing fraud or bringing harmful pharmaceutical products into supply chains. In addition to my founding role at Sverity GmbA, I'm chairman of the supervisory board of the so-called ID Union SCE. And soon I will give you an introduction what this all is about. Yeah, at Sverity, so our massive transformative proposition is credentialing the world for a new internet age with digital trust. So we believe that digital trust can only be established with an interoperable, scalable, fully automated digital backbone where electronic signatures are embedded, are burned into to establish trust about previous unknown uh, supply chain actors. So at Sverity, so we primarily focus on pharmaceutical supply chain because pharmaceutical supply chains are pretty regulated. There is a lot of there are a lot of compliance requirements such as attributability, non-repudiation, electronic records, electronic signatures, security, authorization, key rotation. And we, we believe that decentralized identity verifiable credentials are really a fantastic match to achieve these compliance requirements. In addition to pharma supply chain, so we work with public sector customers in US and in Europe, in Germany, primarily also with the ID Union project, with mobility customers, energy customers, and we have a lot of partners. It's because we don't think that we should kind of invent a Web3 from Greenfield out of, the, out of thin air. So we believe we should be looking into technologies that can work together, legacy systems, new decentralized identity, uh, existing systems, new Web3 technologies by retrofitting these two technologies or basically integrating a wallet with an SAP system or integrating a wallet with a manufacturing execution system, integrating a wallet with a global artwork database because we believe that this, this kind of retrofitting enables bootstrapping and fully scalable applications of decentralized identity. As we're looking to compliance solution, we are certified, SAP certified, ISO certified. And uh, so we have two products, uh, pharma supply chain compliance solution for the US and the digital product passport. And I will introduce a bit the digital product passport and what, what kind of technology do we apply? As mentioned, decentralized identity, we bring it in a secure and compliant way into cloud software as a service solutions. Uh, as, and with secure APIs, we plug it in into existing SAP systems, for example. Today, what's on the agenda? So I will introduce you about the German-European decentralized identity ecosystem. Um, I will talk about decentralized identity as a meta platform, how cooperation beats aggregation, introduce you to the IC Uni, ID Union, Societas Cooperative Europe. I will also introduce you what this is about talk a bit about the identity continuum and the Gaia X ecosystem. Now have a look, let's have a look in the European ecosystem. And there's a lot of stuff going on. It's just a few examples. So the European Union, they basically have a very strong 
Horizon 2020 Research Initiative. And in this research initiative, they support a lot of digitization programs. And at the heart of most digitization programs is decentralized identity. So one of this is the EU digital wallet. And other project is GaiaX. It's a self-sovereign European cloud infrastructure. And at the heart of the self-sovereign European cloud infrastructure is again uh, decentralized identity. Then they have the European blockchain service infrastructure. They have a European self-sovereign identity framework project. Then going into further into Germany, so we have a big research project which is called Front Shop Window or Lighthouse Secure Digital Identities. I think it's another 100 million, uh, around, around about 100 million um, research, uh, government funded research projects. And one of these key pillars of the Lighthouse project, Secure Digital Identity, is ID Union. But also, in addition, let's say to general purpose decentralized identity infrastructure projects, there's also domain specific projects such as Pharma Ledger with pure focus on pharma. Uh, use cases from supply chain to R&D to consent management um, of patient and clinical trials with the huge breadth of different different projects. And um, there's also regulation going on. There is the EIDAS regulation here in Germany and what's in electronic identity for access services. And what is interesting about this, this is being revised now. And it looks like that we will see a hybrid solution of um, existing classical X509 technologies or federated identity technologies and decentralized identity technologies. And suddenly decentralized identity at, at, is at the heart of the European digital identity wallet. And I would like to show it to you. So the European Commission and the head of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, they're really pushing hard to establish digital identity for all Europeans, to digitize our personal identity card, to digitize our driver license across all European member states. So this is a big, big project. And um, the, the, the top of the European Union is on, on, on top of the agenda um, to really enable um, the establishment of a European digital identity wallet for all for all European citizens. And why is this needed? So because it's digital identity and the wallet is the heart of all digital transformation projects. So when people need to log on to services, um, go to the government, interact in e-health, um, uh, uh, being onboarded to e-commerce platforms. And this is of course for compliance, anti-money laundering, security, and some other propositions. So therefore, we need to have a secure digital identity in Europe. And you see here, there's a lot of kind of yeah, stuff going on to establish this uh, across all European citizens. I think that's one of the flagship, uh, flagship um, identity projects, and it's called the European Digital Identity Wallet. But having said this, the so regulation is not only about human identity, it's also about object and enterprise identity. There's another regulation, which is being called the digital product passport going on here in Europe. And there is one very important word in the digital product passport. It says digital product passport information must be verifiable. And when digital product passport information are verifiable, then we need electronic signatures. And again, suddenly we have decentralized identity at the heart. There are other regulations such as supply chain law, identity for enterprises when they're being onboarded in terms of labor rights, environmental standards, ESG. Um, so yeah, there, then again, we need identity and that's at the core of, of the regulatory policies endorsed by the European Union or some, some, some niche use cases such as digitizing the leaflet of pharmaceutical products, which is being called electronic product information, EPI, and digitizing the e-leaflet has, 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 is a very nice use case because it's not so super complex in terms of supply chain digitization. You have a finished product, you digitize the leaflet, a manufacturer does it, a patient scans the package of a product, um, resolves the uh, 
service endpoint of the e-leaflet, gets the e-leaflet, cryptographically verifies it. That is was kind of created by the manufacturer. It's not revoked. It's authentically coming from the pharmaceutical drug manufacturer and the data have not been manipulated. And these, these, these are the use case that scale, that scale fast. And when you when you integrate with existing systems, you can put billions of pharmaceutical products on such an infrastructure. And that, that's the kind of projects that are going on in the European Union. So what is the value proposition of decentralized identity? So I, I like I like the Met, Metcalf's um, um, scaling law, which is 40 years old and from the early days of the internet. And it's basically saying that when we establish standards and enable different participants in the economy to interact and to communicate among each other, so then we have network scale effects. And when we then establish decentralized identity as a meta platform among multiple networks or multiple platforms, then suddenly we have network of network scale effects. And this is super scaling law. I think decentralized identity as a standard that establishes interoperability and frictionless exchange of data and frictionless establish a frictionless capability to end-to-end -end verify data, to end-to-end -end verify identity credentials, to, end -to, to verify um, assertions about a counterparty in terms of are they authorized to do something, do they have a driver license, is this a company with an ISO certification, is this a company that treats the environmental okay, um, and when I can basically verify this, I have frictionless digital backbone to check all kind of assertions, to reduce my risk when interacting with the counterparty, but also to make sure I'm um, in line with compliance requirements, which is which is great. There's also a research paper, and um, I think together with Benny, we put the link to the research paper in the notes of this um, webinar. What's interesting, having said this, Meta Platform is not a centralized server, it's really a set of standards. So if different ecosystems, enterprise ecosystem, platform ecosystems, the metaverse and even the family ecosystem are capable of kind of communicating via these standards, they all can talk to each other. And with, with the credentials, they can establish credential-based trust and authentication. They can sign consent and business agreements, digitally sign them. They can, they can use it for credential-based access control. Are you authorized to access my APIs? Are you authorized to go to the store? And of course, they can establish all kinds of audit trails and fulfill a lot of compliance requirements. And for that, from my perspective, decentralized identity technology at the core does not only enable the network of network effects, but is also a compliance technology. So this is needed to make our, our world more safe, secure, and yeah, compliant with, um, with regulations. Now I'm going to ID Union. Yeah? And what you also can do, you can check out the ID Union webpage. Um, we will also provide some links in, on the on the ID Union side. It tells a bit about the ID Union consortium, the ID Union network, so why we need, why we kind of use self identity at the core of ID Union, some principles, openness, neutrality, transparency, sovereignty, integrity, and cooptation and long-lasting, durable organization. A couple of the partners, and when you when you go to the partners, you see it's kind of it's corporate Germany. So the vast majority of the big companies, small medium enterprises, are part of ID Union, and they are really kind of pushing forward the boundaries um, and pushing forward adoption of decentralized identity in Germany and beyond, because we also have partners from Switzerland, Austria, Netherlands, and some other European countries. Yo, going back to my presentation, so ID Union, it's a government funded research project. So the Federal Ministry of um, Economic Affairs and Climate Actions, they are pushing forward secure digital identities in a similar way as the European Union does. So with their policy goals, but also with their government funded um, research projects. So as mentioned, so we have a vast amount of corporate Germany big DAX companies, small medium enterprises, pushing forward this digital identity initiative. And they're coming from all kinds of industries. Yeah? It's automotive industry, yeah? the automotive OEMs, it's automotive 
tier one suppliers, it's um, travel and transportation with the German railway uh, company, Deutsche Bahn, it's Siemens, energy, smart city, um, mobility, airport infrastructure, technology, it's T-Labs or Deutsche Telekom, big telecommunication provider, GS1, they provide a lot of um, standards for supply chains, it's a banking industry, it's a health industry, it's, it's, it's a vast, um, it's a post, post, it's German post industry, so it's, um, it's really a vast, vast amount of company representing a huge breadth and diversity of, of, of corporate Germany. And of course, we are also participating in the ecosystem here. Of course, it all starts most of the times with human identity. Yeah? And for that reason, we have wallets and then a person who kind of has a self-sort identity wallet. In this case, it's a listy wallet, has um, credentials and has a wallet installed, can acquire credentials such as a personal identity card. You see here a personal identity card derived from the physical German um, um, yeah, from the physical German plastic identity card, it's, it's the derived electronic version of it. You have it in your wallet and then you acquire, can acquire more, more credentials, your health, health club membership credentials, your student membership credentials, diplomas, um, COVID credentials, whatever you like. And yeah, of course, credentials are being issued by issuer and then verified. You're all aware of the trust triangle. And that's also being enabled with, with the wallet, with the human wallet. Um, but of course, in IDU, we don't even have human wallet on edge devices, such as mobile phones. So we also work with a lot of cloud technologies. So we can manage credentials in the cloud, integrate it by APIs with existing legacy infrastructure. So that we can, that we can establish verification modules yeah, that are integrated with, for example, core banking systems. Um, and also issuing models that are integrated uh, with, with, with cloud technology or on-premise technology and with existing trust service provider infrastructure or the gym, the gym membership cloud service integrates with wallet and then I issue credentials. And for that reason, so we are doing both working on the cloud infrastructure, making secure and compliant, but also providing um, yeah, wallets to humans. And yeah, so we, we are using a DLT network. Um, in this case, it's Hyperledger technology, Hyperledger Indie technology, and here you see, aha, so we have a lot of node operators, so we have secure onboarding and offboarding processes, who's operating a node, yeah, and how do we manage it, and how do we kind of uh, release upgrades the software, that's the kind of stuff we are doing, it's a lot of, so we're kind of supporting this network. Um, with a lot of research activity, cybersecurity, interoperability, user acceptance, reg regulatory reviews, this kind of stuff. And why are we doing this? Because we would like to enable use cases. Uh, so we have a breadth of, we start with a breadth of use cases, government, education, financial services, industry 4.0, um, identity and access management, e-commerce, mobility, and e-health. So I'm personally working very deeply in the e-health sector. Uh, in ID Union, so we have a lot of use cases, and now we have a little bit of consolidation. Yeah, get rid of the vast, huge number of use cases, but focus on a couple of use cases, domain use cases, and make sure we can bring stuff into production with a full uh, ecosystem for a given use case niche. Yo, how do we govern this? To govern this, so we, we established the ID Union SCE, Societas Cooperative Europe. And this is a co European cooperative. And this is really nice because, as mentioned, when we have this distributed infrastructure that's being built upon distributed ownership, all these nodes are owned by different companies. Yeah? And we would like to make it uh, secure and compliant and to coordinate onboarding, offboarding, conformance criteria and other processes. So we need to have a organization. And that's the European cooperative that we have, that we used as a legal framework. What is interesting, a cooperative, every members are equal, every member has one, has, has one vote, then um, that's, uh, it's kind of, let's say, it's not a commercial, kind of legal entity that focuses on profit. No, it's a it's cooperative legal entity that focuses on establishing a network, making it secure and compliant, and enabling its members to use it, to scale their use cases, to provide education, to make it successful. 
And here you see you have a supervisory board. I'm chairman of the supervisory board at the moment. We have technical committee, policies committees, public sector committees, committees, couple of committees, a management board. And with the, so we have two board members and that kind of doing all the operational business to really push forward the, um, the cooperative, make sure other companies are joining. So we have our financials um, yeah, being kind of managed. And of course, we have the governance structure to, to really be able to steer and control the underlying distributed ledger technology network, but also to define standards, conformance criteria, um, coordinate software upgrades of the networks and these kind of things. Yeah. As mentioned, we have a couple of use cases in the different use case domains. And here you see for each domain, we established an um, ecosystem. We call it a minimum viable ecosystem that when we do something, um, so we have the ecosystem partners so that we can really establish a proof of concept, a field test, and then potentially move it to production. And so in the e-health sector, so we are working with a company, Compu Group Medical, that's basically providing software for doctor offices. Yeah, So taking software for doctor offices, plugging in a wallet, retrofitting existing software in the doctor offices enables doctors to issue credentials such as medical proof credentials or basically plugging this into an um, insurance system. Insurance company can issue insurance uh, status credentials for, the, for, for, their, yeah, uh, for their patients. And then a patient can go to a doctor, present the insurance status credential, and the doctor knows, aha, this patient has the following insurance coverage, and now I can do a spe special treatment for the guy, and I can even charge and bill it. And that's, that's the kind of things we're doing here. But not only for, for e-health, as mentioned, government, education, financial services, banking industry, industry for all, big thing, enterprise identity, object identity, IoT identity, e-commerce mobility, and identity X management. These are all the kind of stuff we are doing in, in ID Union. So the European cooperative was just established. And now our focus is on productive network, yeah, making really operational readiness. So we have a test network with a quasi production network or kind of, let's say, pre kind of pre-production, but we use it for, for testing production. And then there will be real production network. And on the quasi productive network, there are also yeah, some productive use cases already. But that's important because there's a lot of criteria um, that needs to be fulfilled. Again, security, compliance, processes, maintenance, um, integration. These, these things are being addressed now so that by end of the year, we have a productive network. And then the next step is, hey, we have a productive network. We need to build a trust framework. Yeah? So how do we do identity proving? How do we do a trusted issuer list? How do we know who is issuing as a trust service provider? identity proving credentials, yeah? And how do we know their, their decentralized identifiers, their, their signing keys, and that's being defined in the trust framework, but also again, conformance criteria for the processes, let's say of the trust service providers that are doing identity proving, but also for the technology stack. How do I know it's a secure wallet and not an unsecure wallet? How, how do I know keys are being stored in terms of wallet security in a secure enclave and they're not stored in an Excel spreadsheet because I, as a trust service provider, only would like to interact with wallets that are secure. And I, as a verifier, only accept credentials from wallets that are secure. If they're unsecure wallets storing a private key in an Excel spreadsheet, I don't want to interact with them. Otherwise, the risk would be too high. And this is very much connected to what's being called level of assurance. So. We have the trust framework at the core is to establish a level of assurance across the different yeah, post infrastructure in the ID union ecosystem. So we have a lot of use cases. So we have, we can address with a addressable customer base with all the corporate Germany companies of more than 50 million customers and um, yeah, more than 20 million citizens that can be kind of addressed by the government entities that we are interacting with. And there's, there's, there's considerable investment from the German government that's being matched with, uh, with another 15 million from, from the um, corporates that are interacting in the ID Union project. <coughs> ID Union is also high relevance for Gaia X. And I would like to give you a short introduction what Gaia X is about. 
because Gaia X is a um, self sovereign yeah, cloud infrastructure. Before I do this, a few words on the digital identity continuum. Most people are kind of connecting self sovereign identity for citizens. That's where the name is come, coming from self sovereign. I, I, as a citizen, I, as a person, control my credential. I am self sovereign. But also, you can use the digital identity for providing identity and digital twins for objects, IoT, um, fast moving consumer goods, pharmaceutical products, um, digital assets for all kind of physical and digital objects. Of course, legal entity identity, very important because if you don't have legal, ent legal entity identity, then all these citizen use cases don't work. Yeah? So businesses need a wallet too. They need to go through identity proving so that I as a citizen now, I'm interacting with Siemens or Bosch and not interacting with the fake Siemens or fake Bosch. This is really big part of security that I have a trusted issuer or a trusted verifier and trust issuer, trust verifier scenarios only possible when I have legal entity identity. And then I can move forward, employee identity, there's a prediction that the first credentials at scale will be issued um, um, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a corporate environment for employees, yeah, to give them employment credentials, authorization credentials, training credentials. Training credentials are important, again, for compliance, because only trained personnel might operate, might be allowed to operate a machine. Yeah? And for that reason, so kind of plugging in wallets in a corporate identity and access management into corporate HR systems, this will allow to scale immediately, uh, let's say as one button push more or less, yeah, to scale decentralized identity in the corporate environment and also enable um, yeah, mean, meaningful use cases there. And then of course we can move from, 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 this, from, from, from employee to machines, IoT devices, SAP, manufacturing execution systems, or from one legal entity to tier end supplier. And then, then it's getting getting more complex with data confidentiality. How do I know a tier end supplier of, a, of my supplier is kind of compliant with ESG requirements? How do I know this? And But I don't want to disclose a name or just want to disclose some other stuff. And then, then I have to deal with a lot of yeah, data confidentiality, pri privacy, privacy technology requirements as well. And of course, the citizens, and that's kind of continuum that, that, that we see where digital identity is being applied. And in Gaia X, the entire continuum is being addressed. And here is um, that's a Gaia X Federation services, and they also focus on identity and trust. Yeah, and again, I would like to go to the uh, to website, to the Gaia X website. And what you see here, so become a Gaia X member. So it's 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 a big it's a big push in Europe to establish a sovereign self-sovereign cloud infrastructure. And it's not only few companies; it's 1,800 companies, yeah, that are working on this. And you can say, uh, okay, it's a big research project. No, it's not. It's a big ecosystem development project, yeah, because as a government, you can fund doing research work. But as a government, you can also fund the formation of digital ecosystems. And because decentralized identity technology is an ecosystem technology, so if you have the world best decentralized identity technology in your lab, it doesn't matter if you don't have fully developed ecosystems, ecosystems with, a, um, with common objectives, with a, with, with a joint business case, a kind of, let's say, common education, um, with adoption strategy, kind of to roll out the, the decentralized identity and retrofit their systems. And I think that, that's the biggest value what kind of governments in Europe and in Germany are doing. They're investing in building ecosystems. So when the technology is there, they can be plugged in an entire ecosystem. People know, okay, what to do. It can be scaled. And then suddenly it's meaningful what's, what's going on on the, um, uh, yeah. On, on the project side of these ecosystems. So at the core of Gaia X, because the self zone is identity and trust, and yeah, their use cases, as mentioned, for cyber physical systems, where there is kind of uh, infrastructure in an energy grid, electric vehicles, batteries, solar cells, refrigerators, companies, whatever they are, the assets get, in this example, in this case study here, the asset gets an identity and then I know, aha, there's an, there's an asset 
an asset with some master data about it, transaction data. I can start to trust it. It might be a flexibility. I might want to control it to reduce demand or increase demand or feed, feed even energy back into the grid. These flexibilities are extremely important for the German and European energy transition to stabilize the grid. I have a lot of micro and tiny flexibilities. I aggregate them to the big virtual flexibility and suddenly I have, yeah, I have aggregated a lot of them. I have a huge virtual battery and I can use this virtual battery to stabilize my grid. But having said this, my virtual battery only works if I can trust the, 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 the individual flexibilities. If there are no fake cars, but real electric vehicle batteries. If they're not fake solar cells, real, uh, real solar cells, where I can send a control signal that are qualified. And when I send a so -called, so control signal, then, be, then behave in a certain predictable way so that I can really aggregate them to stabilize the grids. Yeah? And here it's kind of for the distribution system operators, the grid operators for aggregation propositions and grid stabilization propositions, but also for maintenance. Because if I know, let's say I have a network station and the network station that was basically exposed a lot of heat, yeah, because even again, because of climate change, sometimes there's more heat, more, more flooding, whatever, yeah, then I can do this predictive maintenance best, better, and then I can optimize the grid, optimize the cost of the grid, optimize the stability of the grid, and that's, that's these are the kind of cyber physical use cases and just energy as an example. And to be able to do this, the federation services at the core of the federation service, again, identity and trust, authentication, authorization, personal credential manager, organizational credential managers, machine credential managers, so that machines can be can get wallets, trust services, a couple of other things, notarization, portals, sovereign data exchange, federated catalog for for um, for um, um, yeah, for identifying assets in my grid, for example, for discovery, um, these, these kind of things. And again, it's a triangle of, of trust for federators. And here you see again, aha, uh -huh, I have an issuer, I have a holder and a verifier. And it doesn't matter whether it's a person, an entity or a machine, it just works. And then I have so-called notarization services. And a notary might do the identity proving, a notary might issue an ISO certificate, whatever the notary is doing and suddenly have verifiable, secure and compliant infrastructure for these use cases. Yeah, and again, you see different components here. There are also trust services, when I have authorization chains, provenance change, when I chain in credentials, how do I kind of verify them? How do I know it's the root of trust? How do I establish it? And that's being defined in the, in the trust service component, but also when it comes to authentication authorization, how do I do my policy decision? My, my, how, do I how do I check whether someone is being authorized in accordance to a given um, authorization policy that's, that's, that's being described here? One of the use cases we are doing, because as I mentioned, so we're concerned about climate change and the biodiversity collapse. So we love the European Green Deal and the European Green Deal forces industry to find new ways of using resources. Yeah? And for that, the digital product passport product passports were being established. And because we also worked with the people who endorsed the policy, so we, we introduced one very important word into the European Green Deal policies for, for the product passport, and this is the word verifiable. Product passports, and according to European law, shall be verifiable. And if information, assertions about a product in a product passport or in a digital twin of a product are verifiable, then I need digital signatures and then I need kind of a meta platform to make sure that all participants in a circular economy, which is the maximum network I can think about, circular economy, everyone is being kind of kind of concerned about this, integrate into this. And when all participants need to be able to verify something, I need standards, a meta platform, decentralized identity, key management, credentials to sign something, and that's that's why we are super excited about this. But also we are getting requests from New Zealand, from Canada, and even from South Korea, kind of to work with us on the product passport, because when the other countries that are exporting products and services to the European Union, they don't have a digital backbone 
to establish a digital verifiable digital product passports for the yeah for the product that they're exporting, then they lose market access because in the near future there's an obligation that you can only export products into the European Union if you have a verifiable digital product passport. So this this is what we like, and we even have one one company from South Korea that started engaging with us on um, yeah on understanding what digital product passport is and how it can be put into um, into real life action. So why is this being done? Digital product passports close the information gap uh, to enable reuse, repair, and recycling of products and their components. Not sure if you guy uh, guys knows um, Bob the Constructor, this um, TV show for childrens. And Bob the Constructor also always were concerned about reuse, repair, and recycling of products and material. And now we are putting a digital backbone in, uh, yeah, into action in Europe to really enable the management of reuse, repair, recycle things and to close the information gap. But it's not only closing the information gap, it's also about making sure the information are verifiable in accordance to the European Green Deal policy regulations. Yeah, what is a European product passport? It's basically um, a kind of material flow diagram. Um, the idea is it starts with mining and refinement of critical minerals. So what critical minerals do we have? Aluminium, copper, graphite, um, cobalt, um, lithium. So these kinds of minerals, min minerals. So it's being kind of from mining and refinement. It's sent to manufacturing and cell manufacturing, module assembly, battery assembly, and here you have a verifiable product flow of the of the entire battery. Mm. So how do we do it? So we basically have a EV battery with this entire um, product history that enables me to recycle things. I scan an identifier, I resolve the service endpoint, go to digital twin and get the verifiable information either on a smartphone or is or in enterprise application that shows the environmental footprint and shows compliance with with regulations. Yo, so this this is what what we do here in Europe. So I basically um, explained a bit about um, uh, ID Union, the research landscape, Gaia X, some use cases, and yeah, looking forward to staying in touch with you. Thanks again, Benny, for having me on the show. So we provide a couple of links in the notes to the show and I will also answer some questions in a in a blog that's being set up by Benny and Benny. Thanks again for having me. Looking forward to staying in touch and um, I'm sending my regards and all the best to South Korea. Thanks again.